Um, so, um, first of all, before I introduce our special guest tonight, um, I'd like to thank all veterans. If there, I know there are some veterans here tonight. If you'd like to raise your hand, then um, thank you. All. Um, being Veterans Day weekend, I want to make sure that I thank all of you, and I'd like to thank your family. It's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about our guests this evening. And believe me, it's only going to be a little, because if I went through all of his accomplishments, his awards, his volunteer work, his education, and his honors, we'd never get to the program. Um, so this is going to be a very abbreviated version. Dr. James Wright is President Emeritus of Dartmouth College of the Ivy League. Big stuff. <laughs> um, he's a noted historian and professor, and he's the author or editor of several history books. He's a, he accomplished great things for the college. He expanded and diversified the faculty, lowered student-faculty ratios, tripled the budget for undergraduate aid, and offered free tuition to students whose family income is below a certain level. While still at Dartmouth, he began visiting military medical facilities in D.C., where he met military personnel who had been injured in Iraq or Afghanistan. In his continuing visits, he encouraged servicemen and women to continue their education. Eventually, Dr. Wright worked with Senators Jim Webb, John Warner, and Chuck Hagel on the GI Bill that was passed by Congress and signed by President Bush in 2008. He also worked with the American Council on Education to create a new educational counseling program for wounded veterans. Dr. Wright himself is a veteran of the U.S. Marines. He enlisted at the age of 17 and served for three years. He left as a Lance Corporal. When Dr. Wright stepped down from the presidency at Dartmouth, he focused more on the support of veterans research, writing, and public speaking on matters related to education and veterans. On Veterans Day 2009, Dr. Dr. Wright spoke at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C. He's lectured or participated in discussions on war veterans at colleges and universities all over the country. Probably out of the country as well, I, I believe. Um, his efforts on behalf of veterans in education have been featured in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Christian Science Monitor, uh, NPR, ABC World News, BFW Magazine, and in February of this year, he received the Secretary of the Army Public Service Award. Tonight, he's here to talk about his latest book, which we have copies over here. He'll be happy to um, sign them for you if you'd like to purchase one after the program. Um, it's called Enduring Vietnam, An American Generation and Its War. In this book, he focuses on the soldier stories. Who were they? Where did they come from? What happened to them? I was listening to you, I'm getting, because I listened to one of your talks already online, it's really moving. Um, he uses this book to paint a portrait of some of the people who were in Vietnam and why they were there. This is a book of human stories. One of his stories talks about the Vietnam War experience, experience of Winthrop President Donald Sullivan, a second lieutenant serving in the Army at Hamburg Hill in May of 1969. Mr. Sullivan is a decorated veteran. We have um, many of his... Um, medals over there today. Um, he earned more than 16 medals, including the Purple Hat and the Silver Star. He has also worked to help veterans by assisting the Army <coughs> in their study of PTSD. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wright. Thank you. And you're all wondering if that's a short introduction. You're sure glad to subject you to, to the long one. But, uh, Diane, I, I want to thank you for, for inviting me to participate in uh, this program. Uh, this library is a, a lovely and lively place. And I value immensely what, what an institution like this can mean to a community. It's a privilege for me to be here as we prepare to celebrate Veterans Day, and I'm, I'm honored to see so many veterans here and uh, distinguished guests, and I'm, it's a particular treat for me uh, to be here with uh, Don Sullivan. I'm always delighted to be in the company of veterans, and Veterans Day is that occasion for us to do what we should do every day, which is thank them for their service and their sacrifice. And uh, to be here with somebody like Don Sullivan makes this a very special occasion. Most of you know him as a good neighbor and an involved citizen here in Winthrop. I know him as the kid who went to war. Uh, he, he, can, he contributed more than I could easily summarize 
to my study and, and my understanding of the Vietnam War. And I want to share with you a little bit about that, and, and then he's going to uh, give you some of his reflections on this experience. Now this fall, we've had occasion to remember and to think about the Vietnam War. Uh, the Ken Burns and the Lynn Novick series on public television brought it all back uh, to our attention. It's time, in fact, it's long past time. Uh, it's time to remember. It's long past time for us to do that. And it's time to think and to learn. Over 58,000 Americans died in Vietnam. 331 of them were from Massachusetts. Eight names on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall are listed as being from Winthrop, Massachusetts. And alphabetically, they are Robert Belcher, who was 22 years old. Paul Brugman was 20. Edward Cordeau was 21. Joseph Countaway was 20. Joseph Logan Jr. was 24. Edmund McMeal III was 26. Joseph Pignato was 21. And John White was 20. These are the names that are on the wall. Many more served. Many of you are here tonight. It's a different world today from that world in which you served. 52% of the men my age, those of us over age 75, are veterans, 52%. 37% of men age 65 to 74 basically the Vietnam generation. 16% of men aged 55 uh, to 64, I'm sorry, 65, 74 is Vietnam, and then 16%, 55 to 64, and on down, and, and finally, it's 1% uh, uh, or so of uh, people served today. You don't need to be a statistician or a demographer to know what direction this is moving. Those of us who had high percentages aren't, aren't going to be around to keep that percentage up forever. What this means is that more of us who are disconnected from the experience of serving will acknowledge fewer who do serve. And I think that makes it even more critical for us to know what it is that they do, what it is that they have done, what it is that we ask them to do on our behalf. And we should never forget that. Those who serve are serving on our behalf, and they're taking on an assignment on our behalf. Last year, my wife Susan and I attended a performance of Hamilton on Broadway. And I remember coming back from the theater, one of the lines kept running through my head. Eliza Hamilton, the widow of Alexander Hamilton, sang along with a chorus of founding fathers, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? This is so relevant to, to my remarks, and indeed it's relevant to my book, and my book was essentially completed then, but I kept thinking about it because it said so much about the book that I'd just been written. It's relevant because in any armed confrontation, <coughs> the first questions are the determinative ones. Who lives? Who dies? apart from all other descriptions, all other perceptions, all other stereotypes that we may have about war, this is the fundamental question. It's the tragic consequence, indeed we must never ever forget this, killing or being killed is the cruel purpose of war. That is what war is, kill or be killed. 
That's why I've had so much trouble in recent years, and I've written on this with a boots on the ground metaphor that politicians and pundits sometimes use to describe sending combat troops one place or another. I keep saying, we are not talking about shoe leather. We're talking about flesh and blood. We're talking about our sons and our daughters. And we're asking of them who lives and who dies. And we dispatch them to these places. We may have to do it. Sometimes it's necessary. But nobody should ever escape the fact what it is that we're asking them to do. But then the, the burden the burden that continues after the shooting stops is the lingering question, who tells your story? And that's something that more of us can share. The shared narrative of battles and wars fought, of those who served and those who sacrificed. We have to know this better. It can provide us an account of a life lost. It can remind us of who this was and it marks forever the lives of the survivors who knew them and who carry the memories. And those who serve with them and carry their own memories and their own experiences. Several years ago, I decided I wanted to write about the Vietnam War. But not a, quite a traditional study of the war. I really wanted to tell the story about that generation who served in Vietnam. And in many ways, my own life, my own experiences growing up, uh, I was pre-Vietnam. I served in the Marines from 1957 to 1960. My father was a World War II veteran. Going into service is something that we did. And I wasn't sure we ever quite knew the story of those who served there. I knew I had some things to learn I knew I probably had something to say that I had to say, but first I had to convince myself that I was capable of saying it. In 1965, when the American ground war began, uh, it began the, the Vietnam War began several years before that, but President Johnson sent in combat troops, the first Marines went ashore on what came to be known as China Beach in Da Nang in March of 1965. Uh, my wife, Susan, and I were on that beach just a couple of weeks ago. It's a lovely beach area today. And the Marines didn't have any trouble coming in. They were met by Vietnamese young women with flowers, welcome to Vietnam. <coughs> but when that war began in 1965, the dominant public image of those serving in Vietnam was really of young heroes fighting communists someplace in the jungles of Southeast Asia. I'm sure most Americans in 1965 would have been hard pressed to find Vietnam on a map. But they knew it was a bad place and they knew that the dominoes were falling and our kids <coughs> had to go there to fight. But it was really quite remarkable how within a few years as casualties increased significantly, as we sent more and more troops in, as the draft picked up and more and more draftees were serving, that many Americans came to consider those who were serving over there not so much as heroes but as objects of sympathy fighting a cruel and an ill-advised war. After the story of Me Lai broke in December of 1969, when a unit of the Americal Division uh, killed probably 600 civilians, massacred them really, at a village called Me Lai. After that story broke, the dynamic shifted and Rather than victims of a cruel war, now the American kids serving over there were identified often as perpetrators of a cruel war, of drug-addled psychotics. 
I think of it as the Apocalypse Now movie depiction. I say that, that in the book uh, that Apocalypse Now uh, is really Vietnam meets Woodstock. I, I've said on other occasions that, that Apocalypse Now may be a good movie, but it bears as much relationship to the experience of the kids who fought in Vietnam as, uh, say, the play South Pacific deals to those kids who fought in the South Pacific in World War II. I did say that it was not very accurate at a, at a gathering out in Burbank, California last spring, and one of the first hands from the audience was from somebody who said I was one of the screenwriters for that movie, and we worked very hard to make it accurate. And I didn't debate the point with him. <laughs> I guess my point is that is in, in none of these accounts, whether it was uh, heroes in the jungle or the Mi Lai perpetrators, did people really acknowledge and recognize those serving over there for what they were? These were scared kids. These were scared kids who had signed up for a difficult and a very scary assignment. One that became more scary as time went on. We know that generation as the baby boomers, the 60s generation, the Woodstock celebrants, the anti-war protesters, the stereotyped hippies who challenged the boundaries of American culture. And surely they were that, and they did that, and they contributed greatly in pushing the boundaries. But it was also clear to me that these images do not provide the full face of this generation. Not at all. Most people don't know that 40% of the men of the baby boomer generation served in the military. 10% were in Vietnam. Most people don't know that of the baby boomers, far more of them have their names blasted in stone on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall than went to Canada or went to prison for refusing to fight in the war. Now, they were part of the 60s generation. They also enjoyed the music of Woodstock. I, I interviewed for my book Pat Sajak, uh, who you know is a television celebrity, but uh, he was actually a disc jockey in Vietnam on basically the Good Morning Vietnam show, and we talked about the music that he played over there. Their favorite song was the animals recording of We Gotta Get Out of This Place. <laughs> <laughs> My book tries to tell the story of some of the members of the generation, and it's enriched by over 160 interviews that I completed with men and women who served in combat or medical units in Vietnam, and I really did seek out those who served in combat or medical units. I want to know the story of the ground war in Vietnam, of fighting in Vietnam, and what that experience was. I describe in some greater detail the spring of 1969, which I think of as a pivotal point in the nature of the war. But I have to say, and some, there are times when I look at my book and I'm still moved reading some of these accounts that I, that I include there, but one of them that, that really kept gnawing at me, it was, not somebody who went to Vietnam, he was too young. He was 14 or 15 years old, and I, I made a connection with him, and he said he was home alone one day, he lived in rural Pennsylvania, and uh, there was a knock on the door, and he went there, and there were two soldiers at the door. And they asked if his parents were home, and he said no. They were out, but they just called, and they'd be home shortly, and yes, they could wait. And so they sat on the porch waiting. And he told me that he was so excited to see these guys. He went out and he sat with them on the porch. And he said, I'm just glad to see you. He said, I have a brother in the Army. My brother flies helicopters. He's in Vietnam. We just got a letter from him. He's coming home next month. I can't wait to see him. I'm so proud of him. Do you guys know my brother? And he ran the house. They got a picture of his brother and brought it out and showed it to them. And they didn't say much to him, and his parents came home, and obviously these guys had to, 
tell his parents that his brother would not be coming home from Vietnam, that his helicopter had been shot down over near the Cambodian border. This guy telling me this story 40-some years later still was very moved by it and then embarrassed. He said he ran up in the woods and he just wept and he wept and he wept. He wept about his older brother who was a hero to him and he wept being embarrassed about keeping asking these guys, do you know my brother? when they'd come there with a different mission. Mm -hmm. His father actually asked the guys when his son was killed, and <coughs> they said on June 6th, and he said, oh, I guess I'll remember that day, 25 years ago. 1944 was the day I went ashore in Normandy. And that's the day I lost my son in Vietnam. <coughs> I have a chapter in the book on the battle for Dong Apia, a mountain on the western side of the Asha Valley, near the border with Laos. It wasn't far from the old demilitarized zone, which marked the northern boundary of the old South Vietnam, up in I Corps, for those of you who know the territory. The Asha Valley and that whole area in the western part of I Corps is a, a desolate area. It was then, still is. Colin Powell was posted up in the Asha Valley when he first was sent to Vietnam in January of 1963. Colin Powell was a young army officer. At that time, we had advisors over there, and these advisors served with Arvin, with uh, South Vietnamese Army units, and advised them. And he was sent up to advise a, a Arvin unit at a post up in the Asha Valley. After he got his orientation from the local Vietnamese commander, he asked him a question. He said, tell me, why is this outpost here? And the commander said, this is a very important outpost. I'll tell you why it's here. It's here to protect that airstrip down below. And there was a grass airstrip down below <coughs> that didn't take large planes, but planes could come in and out of there. And he said, okay, that makes sense to protect the airstrip. And he said, but what's the purpose of the airstrip there? And the Vietnamese commander said, well, the airstrip is there to supply this outpost. <laughs> Powell thought about it, and he would go back to Vietnam in 68, 69, and be involved in some major combat. He was a more senior officer then, but he said he's never quite sure that he ever heard a better description of some of the circular logic for some of the tactical missions that people were sent out on in Vietnam. <coughs> that western range of the Asha Valley was a difficult place to occupy. We had a special forces camp there until the mid-60s, but in 1969, in spring of 1969, under Operation Apache Snow, the 101st Airborne came back in. The entire area had become a major storehouse for supplies coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It had become honeycombed with bunkers and supply tunnels. Many people in the military called it the warehouse area because it was just a major supply point for the North Vietnamese. On May 10th of 1969, the 3rd Battalion of the 187th Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division came into Hill 937, Dong Ap Bia. The assumption was that it would take a, a day or so to reach the top of the hill, and the nature of, of battles over there at that time had been this. The, the North Vietnamese would see our forces come in, they would fight hard for 20 minutes or so and then fade and get out of there because they knew how much firepower we could bring in. And our assumption was that they would do the same thing that day. Some people said we'll be up there by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and they were. It was actually late morning, but it was 11 days later before they reached the top. Some of the units that went in that first day, including Don Sullivan, suffered 70 to 80 percent casualties. It turned out that the North Vietnamese Army had chosen this hill, this time, to stand and fight. We hadn't expected that. The battalion commander, 
of John Sullivan's unit. I interviewed him, Black Jack Honeycutt, and he said that we didn't have the slightest idea what we were getting into, and the people that briefed us didn't know what we were getting into. The battle became controversial back in the United States because of a sense that it was a violent, extended battle with no clear tactical purpose. And there were not that many extended battles in Vietnam. The Yadrang Valley, and Dok Tho, and Way, Quezon, Hamburger Hill, not a lot of places. Most of them were quick and they were over. But these were extended battles that went on for a, a long time. People wonder what the purpose was, and the purpose was to cut off the supply depot and to take as many enemy casualties as we could. But this all got lost in a bigger controversy over the war and by the fact that our troops were withdrawn days later after they finally reached the top of the mountain. In Vietnam, there was no Mount Suribachi. There was no moment or the iconic moment of raising the flag on top of a hill. In fact, there weren't very many of our flags over there. We, we were we kind of kept them covered because we were trying to insist this was not an American war. It was not about our occupying or staying in places. I tell the story of the battle in order to illustrate in detail the nature of fighting in Vietnam and the courage and the sacrifice of the soldiers there and some of the ongoing controversy over the war. Actually, I interviewed about 26 men who were there. I just talked to one that I didn't interview who called me a few days ago who had been suffering from major PTSD and he'd been there for all 10 days and we had a talk. By the end of the fighting, Hill 937, Dong Ap Bia would be known by the soldiers who were there as Hamburger Hill, the place where the soldiers described being ground up in battle. <coughs> Don Sullivan did as much as anyone to help me understand that battle, and he did as much as anyone to help fight that battle. He was born here in Winthrop. One of the great things about the interviews, I got to know more about these people. And I've had the privilege now of meeting Don a couple times and talking to him. But he grew up in Weymouth and actually thought he might become a Jesuit priest and went to seminary for a couple of years and decided that wasn't <coughs> for him. He decided he'd probably end up teaching English at Holy Cross if he were a Jesuit priest and he wasn't sure that that was the path he would follow. <coughs> so he went to Boston College. <coughs> and he got a degree in economics. And of course, in those days, as soon as you finished college, it meant you're likely to be drafted. And he got his draft notice, and he went to talk to the Army recruiting officer to find out what his options were. And they said, well, you've got a college degree. You could become an officer, but you'd have to serve one or two more years if you're an officer. And uh, Don Sullivan said, why would I want to serve one or two more years? <laughs> and the recruiter said, I'll tell you why. You can either be inside the officer's club drinking a cold martini, or you can be outside of it in the heat on walking guard duty. What would you rather do? And Don decided he would become an officer. <laughs> I'm not sure if you ever had a cold martini in Vietnam. There was plenty of warm beer that was generally available. Uh, to be sure. Don Sullivan went into Dong Ap Bia on the 10th of May when the first units went in. He was a young second lieutenant with the second platoon of Charlie Company. And he was there on the 20th, among the very, very first to step onto the top of the hill, which by then was absolutely devastated of foliage. Of the 42 men in his platoon that had gone in there on May 10th, only 18 of them were there at the end of the battle. That's the sort of fight that it was. Don shared with me <coughs> some of the accounts of that battle that are in my book. One of them that, that I would mention, because it was obviously something that was very important to him, and he was still moved by it and talking about it, was about this young kid from Twin Cities of Minnesota, Buck Dufresne. I talked actually to Buck's sis sister and his teacher back in Minnesota and men who served with him, and he was really quite a guy by every account, and Don Sullivan said that. 
And it was on the 14th that you, Charlie Company, was sent on a sweep, and they just took tremendous losses that day. And in Don's platoon, they got hit by a, a rocket, and one of the young men was badly injured. And Buck Dufresne uh, organized a litter party to try to carry him down to the bottom for a medevac, because the slope of the hill and the fire from the top, the helicopters had difficulty coming in, lifting them there. They tried to get them down lower, where there was more of a clearing. And just as Buck Dufresne organized a litter party, they got hit again by another North Vietnamese rocket from the top of the hill. And I guess the five members of the litter party and the kid they were carrying all were killed. Buck Dufresne was still alive. Don Sullivan said, we're going to get you out of here, Buck. And they, he organized another litter party. There weren't many left to do a litter party to carry Buck down, and although he was badly injured. And Buck Dufresne said, no, it doesn't. Won't, it won't help. I'm not going to make it. Lieutenant, and he said, yes, you will. We'll get you out of here. We're going to carry you down to the hospital. And it was not just Don Sullivan, but two or three others who were there that day that shared with me their powerful memories of that, of, of these men setting off with a litter party with Buck Dufresne, badly injured. And he started singing in this very loud, clear voice, Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Buck didn't survive to the bottom of the hill. Don also told the story of a, the, the 19th when they got orders to go up again, and by then the men had just every day, they were going up and getting orders and saying, we can't go up again. And they got orders, and, and uh, there was a bit of a mutiny in his platoon. The guy said, no, Lieutenant, we, you know, we, 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 we're not going to you know, tell Black Jack to go up himself. We're not going to go up this damn hill again. And Don Sullivan didn't quite know what to do about this. They hadn't really <coughs> trained him in OCS or how to handle a mutiny in a combat zone. <laughs> and as another officer told me about another incident, he said, what the hell are you going to do, threaten to send them to Vietnam? Just not, <laughs> not, not, a lot, not a lot of leverage over them. And so Don didn't know what to do, uh, as, as he told me the story, and he finally went over and picked up his rifle and his helmet and his pack and started walking over toward the trail, and one of the guys said, where the hell are you going, Lieutenant? And he said, well, I got orders. We're supposed to go up the hill. I'm going to go up the hill. And so the guys in the unit said, oh, for God's sakes, we can't let you go up there alone. We, we're going to have to go with you. And so they're just heading down to get their own equipment, and uh, there was another rocket came down, and it didn't injure any of the men, but went over where they were, had left some of their supplies and equipment over at the edge of the clearing. And it, it, it really blew up a lot of the stuff over there. One guy ran over and picked up his pack, and it was soaking wet. And he said, oh, God, those little bastards. He's been carrying a can of fruit cocktail for the last <laughs> week. Because he couldn't wait to have the sweet juice that was in this sea ration can of fruit cocktail. And now it was all shattered and leaked all over his back. And he said, all right, damn it, let's go get him. <laughs> I guess if it takes a can of fruit cocktail to go up to the top, uh, the young officer will accept that. <laughs> Don did get up to the top, and, and he and his men, uh, I don't know, 18 or so of them, got over to Eagle Beach near Way, which was a, an R&R place for people to take a shower and get clean uniforms and have some hot food. And at this time, he, he got a note from his mother saying, Dear Donald, the news this week is all bad. They are constantly talking about the 3-187th taking horrible casualties attacking a hill. I certainly hope you had more sense than to go up there. <laughs> 19-year-old Terry Larson died there on May 11th, Mother's Day. His buddy Greg Burnetta told me that all he could think of that night after his friend Terry died was of Terry's mother back home in Illinois learning that she had lost her son on Mother's Day. 
Tom Martin from New Jersey was wounded that day and he was medevaced to the hospital. He told me that the first thing he saw when he went into the field hospital was a sign saying, May 11th is Mother's Day, did you write home? He realized that he had not written home to his mother. And he said to me all these years later, I was really upset about that. What a Mother's Day present I gave my mom. In working on this book, in addition to my research and reading and interviews and intellectual framing of this story, I knew that I had to visit Vietnam. As I said, when I was in the Marines, I was at Kanyoi Bay, territory of Hawaii. I was at Atsugi, Japan. I was never in Vietnam. And I knew I needed to do more than just go to the current <coughs> tourist spas and thriving cities, that I had to confront Vietnam. I wanted to get out into the Delta. I wanted to go to the high country. I wanted to go to the, to the jungles. I wanted to go to the far reaches of i the places where the baby boomer generation fought and where some of the men whose stories I would tell had died. I worked with a group called Military Histor Historical Tours in the late summer of 2014. I went over. I had a guide, an interpreter, and a soldier who served over there with me. And I visited the Delta, and I realized that only by visiting the Delta could I understand why the young kids who patrolled along the waterways and canals found them scary places. They were still scary places in 2014, with the jungle hanging down over these narrow, narrow canals where these kids would go up in boats and they would be ambushed. I traveled up to Da Nang and I went to the pilings that are the only remnants of the old Liberty Bridge. I visited that area that the Marines <coughs> call Dodge City, southwest of Da Nang. I left behind a hockey puck there for a Dartmouth Marine who had been killed over there and been a great hockey player at Dartmouth. I found the rice paddy where he had been killed and buried a hockey puck there. I looked across at Charlie Ridge, still dark and foreboding 45 years later. I went to Way and walked around the Citadel, the site of intense fighting during Tet. Went out along the old demilitarized zone along Highway 9 from Quang Tri to Khan Tien, then out to the Rock Pile and Razorback and Mutter's Ridge, places that most Americans never knew, but they were surely seared into the memory of those who served at those outposts. And I spent some time just walking around the field at Khe San. I visited Kantum and Pleiku and spent some time at Dok Tho. I talked to some people there in the Army, 299th Combat Engineers that had been hit by a rocket and about a dozen of their men were killed in that. I tried to find the place but it had been all covered up, but I walked around that old airstrip looking for it. And north of there in the old Asha Valley, I, I did what I long wanted to do, what I thought I had to do. I climbed Hamburger Hill. I climbed in late summer heat and humidity. I had met earlier that morning in the village of Alawi with two North Vietnamese Army veterans who had served there in that battle. <coughs> they had fought against the Americans. And I was trying to interview them and I was having trouble with the interpreter. You know, I, and, and they were reluctant to say very much. And I said, would you like to climb the hill with me? I'm going up after lunch. And they said, yeah, two of them did. The third one was still bearing war injuries, couldn't climb the hill, but he waited at the bottom of the hill for us. At the outset, we had a, a brief summer shower, and the trail was covered by, still again now, by triple canopy jungle. It was steep and slippery. And these North Vietnamese who had fought there pointed out things to me that I would have missed otherwise a spider hole, a hole where somebody could go and hide. And pointed out <coughs> places where the, on the older trees the bark was still chewed up and you could see the bullet holes in the bark. I stumbled and slid and sweated and wondered how 
the scared young men of the 101st Airborne Division that climbed that hill in 1969. Knowing they were over 50 years younger than me was not a sufficient explanation for this. No one was shooting down at me, and I wasn't carrying 50 pounds or more of equipment and ammunition as I walked up this trail. It took us around two hours to reach the top. It took them 10 days. Again, an important qualifier took 10 days for those soldiers who reached the top because of the 70 and 80% casualties that many units had. Don was one of the few officers of uh, his company that went in on the, the 10th that was still there on the 20th and to go to the top of the hill. When I was there, I told the North Vietnamese who were with me a, a story. I grew up in a mining town, Galena, Illinois. I joined the Marines at age 17 because I thought it would be better than working in the mines. I might find something else to do. And I came home and I ended up working in the mines for a few years. And I worked underground. Uh, I was on a drill machine. and. I, the boss underground asked me if he said he needed a powderman, would I be a powderman? And I said, a powderman? Setting dynamite charges? I don't know anything about dynamite. He said, you are a Marine. I said, I've never touched a stick of dynamite in my life. I don't. <laughs> he said, we can teach you in a half hour. And they did. And he, <laughs> more importantly, he offered me 25 cents more an hour. And I said, you mean 240 an hour? And he said, yep. And I said, you've got yourself a powderman. <laughs> I worked there under this wonderful boss who was a World War II veteran, had a Purple Heart in World War II, and I got to know his son quite well. And the name of the town is Galena, and that, that's a Latin word for, for lead sulfide, and I, I had a couple pieces of lead. We were mining zinc when I was there, which was much deeper, but I had a couple pieces of this cube lead sulfide I kept on my desk. I told the North Vietnamese that my boss's son was just a great kid. He was drafted in the Army and he was serving with the 187th. And on the 14th of May, 1969, he had a rocket propelled grenade hit him in the chest and he died instantly. I pulled a piece of Galena out of my pocket and I said, this is the name of our hometown that represents our hometown. And I'm going to bury this here, and I can assure you that good solid Galena lead will last a lot longer than the red clay of the top of that hill, and it's uh, still buried over there someplace. In the play Hamilton, George Washington, the old soldier, sings along with Eliza Hamilton. Washington sings, let me tell you what I wish I'd known when I was young and dreamed of glory. You have no control. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story? And my book represents my attempt to contribute to the effort, to the obligation, to, to make certain that some of these stories are told. And Don Sullivan's story is such a compelling one. My regards to all of the veterans here. I thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Memories endure. You know better than anyone that memories don't end with the end of a war. And so all of us, veterans and, and non-veterans, need to join to tell the stories, to listen to the stories, and to learn something from the stories. Eulogy for those kids who were lost in Vietnam has been too long deferred, but eulogy is not sufficient. We need to, to listen, we need to hear, and most importantly, we need to learn something from this. And Don Sullivan can help us with that work of learning. And as we hear his stories and think about this, I guess my only hope is that someday more people can more affirmatively respond to the question, do you know my brother? Thank you very much.
when uh, when Diane first raised the possibility of my speaking on the same program with Dr. Wright, the no was out of my mouth before the question mark was out of hers. <laughs> and I think with the the eloquence, the breadth of knowledge, you know, you understand why I wouldn't want to uh, be speaking following him. He mentioned, I think, another book. This is the other book, Those Who Have Borne the Battle. Uh, I'm about a third of the way through it. Uh, and it is every bit as compelling as I found in During Vietnam. It presents a broader picture of the relationship between the country and those who defend it. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, look at things. Okay, you heard my name is Don Sullivan. Now that you've heard that, I've asked you to forget it. <laughs> and, and there are at least a couple of reasons for that. It's because I hope that I'm here representing the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands, maybe even the millions of combat veterans, uh, men and women, who have endured and are continuing to endure the after effects of their experiences in combat. Uh, despite our differences of background, rank, color, age, ethnicity, whatever it may be, combat veterans are incredibly similar in our experience of the after effects of war. I've spent a fair amount of time in PTSD treatment and as a patient in research studies at the VA. And I'm always amazed, no matter who I'm with in these groups, we're the same. It makes absolutely no difference, you know, what color, what rank, what age, none of it. None of that makes any difference at all. So what we would like to do, we hundreds of thousands, uh, we'd like to share two things with you. One is Agent Orange, and that's a very simple thing. It is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people uh, affected by Agent Orange but it's something that's unique to Vietnam and certain other areas such as Guam, et cetera, where they flew the missions to uh, spread this defoliant. Agent Orange was a product intended to destroy the jungles of Vietnam so that the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong wouldn't have any place to hide. You know, Jim was talking about how the, the scariness of the waterways with the jungle hanging over of the triple canopy jungle on the trail leading up to the top of Hamburger Hill. Uh, what they were trying to do was eliminate that. And Agent Orange is a, a pretty simple thing to deal with because it doesn't apply to all veterans. Uh, the Vietnamese people continue to live today in areas heavily contaminated by Agent Orange. The range of birth defects, uh, illnesses, particularly multiple forms of cancer, it's just devastating when you look at it. And the United States government does not want to acknowledge it, which also impacts the care it provides to veterans here in the United States. We American combat troops are lucky. We haven't lived in that environment for 50 years. We simply slept on the ground, which is where we slept. Most of us certainly are combat troops, and we're not in bunks at night or anything like that. We slept on the ground. We drank the water in which the Agent Orange collected when the rains took it off the, the ground. We breathed the air through which it was transmitted, but we had one major advantage over the Vietnamese people, which is we only did it for a year. You know, no, no big thing, right? Uh, there are now 19 adverse health conditions recognized by the VA as caused by Agent Orange such things as uh, type 2 diabetes. If you served in an Agent Orange area, the government presumes that the origin of your type 2 diabetes is Agent Orange. It's important that if you served, and I'm, this, this is the last of this, if you served in an Agent Orange area or in some place like Guam, which is where they flew many of the missions from, or and this is where it gets really weird. If you were in a reserve or National Guard unit, 
and they got hand-me-down planes from the federal government. Those planes very often were contaminated with Agent Orange. And people who were nowhere near Vietnam and not even in the Vietnam era could have picked up Agent Orange poison. Okay, as, a, as an example, I have uh, neuropathy in my legs. Sometimes I can stand up, sometimes I can't. Um, it's Agent Orange related. The government doesn't want to acknowledge that, but private doctors and veterans know that that's one of the things. There are at least eight forms of cancer that are directly related to Agent Orange. There's a thing called the Agent Orange Registry. Uh, we are handing out, or they are available, uh, fact sheets that talk about Agent Orange. They give you just some introductory websites to go to and look at. Because if you've been exposed to Agent Orange, the VA will provide assistance in dealing with the diseases that develop from it. So, and what I'd like to do is go back to being combat veterans and not just the Agent Orange piece of it. Doctor, I talked about the battle for Hamburger Hill and the example he gave of Buck Dufresne singing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Buck, as he said, was one of my men killed in that battle. My battalion, the 3rd of 187th, which theoretically was around 600 men, it should have been more, but everybody was short in those days. Uh, we landed at the uh, base of Dong Apia, which, by the way, in v Vietnamese means Mountain of the Crouching Beast. It certainly came to be true. Uh, my particular helicopter dropped us off at 10.42 a.m. on May 10th. Can I get a volunteer to remember May 10th at 10.42 a.m.? <laughs> okay, Jason, thank you. Can you hear that May 10th at 10.42 a.m. again? Stop me, whatever I'm saying, and just say, you just said May 10th, okay? Um, the first major attack on the top of what became known as Hamburger Hill led to the scenes that Dr. Dr. Wright described. That scene of <clears throat> that scene has lived in my mind and my emotions ever since. One minute I was leading an assault on the top of the hill, and the next six of my men were shattered in front of me. With a sudden suddenness of noise and violence, even today I can't comprehend it. It was just, it was an overwhelming experience. And the feelings, the despair, the guilt, the shock, the feelings of inadequacy. You know, I was supposed to keep these men alive. That was my job. I didn't do it. The funny thing is, what happened that day was only a down payment on what was to come. So let's talk about what is PTSD because that's what this is all about. It's post-traumatic stress disorder. It's existed and been partially described as, at least as early as the ancient Greeks, who were always fighting with somebody. I mean, you know, all of, all of history is the Greeks are fighting with somebody. But it wasn't formally identified by the scientists until the 1970s as a disorder or a disease. And it wasn't added to the medical diagnostic Bible until 1980. It occurs in two stages. Stage one is immediate. It's when the event occurs. And the response is part of the body's autonomic system. What's an autonomic system? If you're breathing, that's autonomic. In other words, your body doesn't control your breathing. I mean, I shouldn't say your body. Your mind doesn't. You don't control your breathing. You can stop breathing for a limited period of time. But sooner or later, your body's going to force you to take a breath. Okay? It's automatic. It's autonomic, as they, as they call it. When confronted with a trauma, such as we're talking about in Hamburger Hill, the body automatically takes over and shuts down certain functions and areas so that blood flow and everything else can be directed to the areas that are going to maximize survivability. That's the nature of that first reaction. 
is the body takes over without your say so and says, okay, these are the things that need to be done. Okay, adrenaline starts flowing. Uh, your mind speeds up. I can't explain. You know, I don't know the biology of it or anything like that, but I've been there. It's happened. Your mind speeds up because it's responding to a survival issue. Non-productive emotions, meaning most of the good ones, are shut down because they're a danger. You know, spending time feeling uh, sad about what's, what you see in front of you, that's not productive. It's not going to keep you alive. So the body doesn't let you do that. But the other thing we have to do is look at what PTS, PTSD is not. Uh, our current occupant of the White House, referring to people with PTSD, expressed his sympathy for those who couldn't take it in combat. Sorry, Mr. President, but you're wrong. How many people have heard numbers like 15% of Vietnam veterans suffer from PTSD? I mean, that's sort of the standard number out there. Um, and up to 30% of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans are supposed to be suffering from PTSD. And you look at that and you say, well, you know, isn't that proof that in fact these people couldn't take it? It's 15%, it's 20%, 25 30 whatever. It's a minority. So this is proof that, you know, these people couldn't take it. In Vietnam, at our peak, when we had 550,000 men there at any one time, only about 10% of those men were combat troops. All the rest were support troops. You know, things like cooks and, uh, you know, uh, supply sergeants and uh, uh, motor pool and so on and so forth. The medical, certainly all the medical team and so forth, except for the frontline medical people. So what happens is, instead of looking at 550,000 people, you're looking at 55, 60,000 who are actual combat troops. In today's conflicts, only about 15 to 20 percent of the troops are direct combatants. Okay, so when you hear that there are, and Jim's going to love this, uh, 200,000 boots on the ground, really what you're talking about is 30 to 40,000 combat troops. Everybody else is making sure that those combat troops have what they need to do the job. So the top PTSD researchers today, uh, and because I'm so involved in the, the research projects, I get to talk to them a lot. One of the things they've concluded is that about 90% of people involved in combat with visible blood and gore develop PTSD. So when you're looking at the 55 to 60,000 people who were combat troops in Vietnam, 90% of those developed PTSD. All of a sudden, a very, very different picture than 15%. Okay? And that number is 90% for combat troops. It might be 30, 40, 60%. I don't know what it would be. They can't figure it out. It's very difficult to nail down for people on fire bases which were not in direct combat usually, but were support of combat. That's why they were created. Okay, so some of those people would have been in combat, so there was some percentage there that will end up with PTSD. But you're still ending up with the vast majority of people who were in combat will develop PTSD. It's a given at this point. What does it look like? First, you know something's wrong. When I came home, I didn't, you know, there was, there was no transition. You know, one day I was in the military, the next day I was out. There was no training. When I went in, they trained me, they dehumanized me. And I don't mean me. When I say me, I'm talking about the hundreds of thousands of us. Because you can't be an effective combat troop if you're worried about the humanity of the person on the other side. It doesn't work. So dehumanization is the very first step. They have to train you not to care about the other person over there. They also have to train you not to protect yourself as the first order of business. 
because if you're doing that, you're not going to be an effective combat troop. Okay, so dehumanization in those two areas is absolutely critical. Um, so the first, when I came back, I knew something was wrong, but I had no idea what. And I felt a pressure that kept on building up. And the only way for me to stop it was to drink. So I spent years as a drunk, literally. And God bless my wife for putting up with me during those years. In addition to drinking or other ways of forgetting, we avoid anything that physically reminds us of that experience. We avoid news stories, you know, pictures of fire bases in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, etc. We avoid certain move, movies. We avoid fireworks. Good God, can we avoid fireworks? Fourth of July is sheer hell. It truly is. When I was younger and could move faster, I could get down to the floor after the first firecracker went off. Now, I'm afraid if I get down on the floor, I won't be able to get back up again. Um, the drinking also helps suppress the unwanted flashbacks on nightmares. I see those men die every day every single day. And it brings back all the same feelings. My psych people are really pleased. Uh, in the last six months, my flashbacks have started appearing in technicolor <laughs> rather than black and white. And they told me they were pleased, and I told them that I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and that I didn't understand why they were. And they said, because your mind is starting to allow you to experience more of the reality <clears throat> that occurred. And that means you're healing. It means your mind is now able to cope with it and feels that you can cope with it. Okay. Lois might have a different reaction to that. But, uh, another thing is, is we end up with great levels of anxiety. Uh, Diane can tell you that having to put up with me for the last two months since I reluctantly agreed to do this has been murder. Because, I'm, you know, what am I going to talk about? When, you know, Jim is so good, I'm going to, you know, put the village idiots in, not there, et cetera. But it's also an anxiety that means I couldn't be around people. Uh, I, my, my brothers may remember we had a cousin who died and we went to a funeral home and we're sharing recollections about the cousin. And we had been there about a half hour, and I had to leave. I just, I had had enough of being around people. That was it. I was running the company, and I told my staff that I didn't want to go into any meeting that would last more than a half hour. Period. And, I mean, I was the CEO. Sometimes you have to go into meetings that last longer than a half hour. But the level of anxiety was such that I couldn't be around people that long. So, if there is one characteristic, however, that, that I think of as being what we see, we're angry. People with PTSD are angry. It's like a volcano sitting there, just waiting for a weak spot to, to throw out some magma or uh, you know, whatever you want to use as an example. Some days are less difficult than others. But something is always there. And I'm, I'm saying this after many years of treatment. Um, most of us have depression, clinical depression. Uh, in many cases, Jim was telling me a story about somebody that he encountered who the depression hit him all of a sudden. And he ended up being hospitalized. And this was how many years? 40 years after the event. Okay, So it's, it's that sort of thing that can happen. We don't expect a normal lifespan, partly because of the Agent Orange in the case of Vietnam veterans, but combat veterans in general do not expect a normal lifespan, partly because we've seen normal lifespans brought to an abrupt halt. We know it can happen. We've seen it happen. So we, we don't expect that. It makes it hard to be motivated about things. The Vietnam era is officially labeled as lasting from 1961 to 1975. 
an average, that means that of the 58,000 people that Dr. Wright talked about, an average of 4,200 people were killed in combat each year that we were in Vietnam. Today, right now, between 20 and 25 veterans every day are dying by suicide. They're killing themselves. Between 20 and 25. Even just using the 20 number, 74% more people die every year, more combat veterans, more veterans die every year than died in a year in Vietnam. 74% more. And the vast majority of those are people with PTSD. In many cases, undiagnosed, untreated, etc. So how did I get diagnosed and treated? On May 10th, at 10.42 a.m., Jason is raising his hand, <laughs> stopping. On May 10th, 1998, at 10.42 a.m., I had a heart attack in Mass General's emergency room. Anybody see a connection? <laughs> Uh, my second heart attack, by the way, was also in May uh, on Memorial Day weekend. You know, maybe a little bit of a connection there as well. So I, I tend to dread May and the 4th of July. <laughs> you know, between, um, I said that earlier that 600 men went up on Hamburg Hill. 200 came back down, and of those, many were wounded. I was wounded on the hill, but I came back down. I went up to Hamburg Hill the 28th ranking lieutenant of 28 in my battalion. I came back down fifth. They like to kill lieutenants, uh, the Vietnamese did. Eventually, the encounter I had with psychiatric, I mean with uh, cardiac rehab, uh, led me to the VA, where I found some really confident, really caring, and understanding people and programs that helped me start thinking correctly again. And that's the most insidious thing about PTSD, is you stop thinking the way you did when you were growing up. You stop thinking positively. You see the negatives. I know a guy that ripped all the foliage out around his house, including the grass and everything else. And every night before he closed up the house for the night, he raked out all the dirt so that he could see if anybody approached the house during the night. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are extremes like that that people go to. My wife can tell you that when we go to a restaurant, I have to choose my seat. I have to sit with my back to a wall or to the point of least danger. When I walked into this room tonight, I did a, an assessment. Uh, the room, the people, what threats were here. You know, especially anybody wearing a Marine Corps hat. <laughs> <laughs> And when, it, when you're somebody that has gone for a long time with PTSD undiagnosed, it is not curable. Because PTSD, undiagnosed and untreated, changes the physical brain. They do PET scans now that can show the changes between you know, what a brain originally looked like in a, in a combat veteran, for instance, and one who is 30 or 40 years into PTSD. However, the kids, I call them kids, uh, the kids from Iraq and Afghanistan, their PTSD can be treated because the brain changes haven't occurred yet, by and large. The early Iraq people started to get borderline. But, so if you know somebody, the other thing on this handout is there is a section on PTSD. And again, they're just intended to be introductory sites where you can follow uh, links to learn more about it. The therapies available today, even compared to 10 years ago, are shorter, they're more effective, and much more accessible. And the VA has ramped up enormously to try to meet the challenge that they're finding with the veterans who are uh, discovering that they do have PTSD. 
So where does that leave us? First, if you know anybody that you suspect might have PTSD, one of the things that appears in this handout, wherever it is, um, is there are apps uh, for the iPad, iPhone, and for the Google Android uh, devices. There are apps that can actually help you diagnose whether somebody has PTSD and can actually coach you through doing some self-improvement, et cetera, et cetera. They've spent enormous amounts of money on them, and from everything I can see, they look like they're really effective. But there are also some th things I would ask you to at least consider from tonight. Number one, PTSD is not, as our president would say, a character weakness, but a virtually universal human response to trauma and horror. With the degree of sub subsequent suffering associated primarily with the degree of horror and the character of the sufferer. Number two, PTSD gets consistently and inexorably worse and less treated the longer it goes undiagnosed and untreated. Number three, effective programs exist for treating it. These programs can offer varying degrees both of anonymity and effectiveness. And number four, all trauma, not just military trauma or combat trauma, and all post-trauma disorder are essentially in the same family, just as you know, different cancers are all cancer, you know, whether it's pancreatic or brain or whatever it might happen to be. They're all in the same family. And there are differences based on whether it's combat, sexual trauma, <coughs> accident, you know, some sort of criminal act, etc. At the end of March, when I received a, a pre-publication copy of Enduring Vietnam, and by the way, when I got that copy, I didn't know whether I was in the book or not. I had not seen anything, etc. Uh, and then I discovered that I was indeed referenced in it. Um, my, fir and, and my first reaction, let me try that again. I wrote to Jim Wright, whom I had never met at that point. I met him at the end of May and then again today. So here's what I wrote. My first reaction after finishing this book was, wow. I'm a Hamburger Hill combat veteran, and I'm in the book, but that is not the basis of my reaction. The story is both of a generation and timeless. Every Vietnam combat veteran will see himself in this book. Every person who served in Vietnam will see him or herself. Every person who lost someone to death or mental illness resulting from Vietnam will see her or himself here. Every person who served in that era and those who avoided service will see her or himself here. If you want to know what really happened without the authors imposing his own judgment on the people involved while still judging the history, then you must read this book. This book is timeless because it conveys the stories of war and people in a way that transcends just one war. You should read this book if you love history, but more especially if you love people. A remarkable achievement. So that's what I wrote at the time, and I feel even more strongly now. Uh, my being referenced in the book has nothing to do with that assessment, and nothing to do with by telling you that Jim's other principal work, those who have won the battle, where did I put it? That's right here. This other book. Uh, it's everybody's compelling, and I am not referenced in it. <laughs> uh, do yourself a favor and get both books and see American history from a totally different perspective, and one that reads like a novel, not boring old history. That's the thing that fascinated me the most. Uh, a disclaimer, I have no financial interest in either book. <laughs> Thank you for being here and honoring American history.